questions. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, so, first of all, before I start, um, I want to thank the organisers um, for the invitation to speak today, in particular, uh, Peter Kaptein and Gogana, who uh, has helped a lot. Um, it's a real honour to be able to speak. I, I, I don't know how often the patient view gets heard, um, but this is the first time for me, and I'm, I'm absolutely delighted. Um, what I want to do, um, I'm going to introduce myself really, and start with by saying that I really shouldn't be alive. Um, if I lived, uh, if I was born just a couple of years earlier, or even a year earlier, if I didn't live uh, here in the Netherlands, if I'd lived, say, in the UK where I was born, um, I would be dead by now. Um, the fact that I'm still here, uh, not just here, but but healthy and enjoying life, is really down to to the researchers, the scientists, the people that perhaps I hope are listening to this, or at least will will watch the recording. Um, and so, it, it's it's a very personal story. Um, and I've got a couple of messages right at the end. Um, this is it very briefly. I was diagnosed with mental lymphoma in uh, 2014. Um, the bit to remember from this slide, I was strong and very fit. I was a referee, rugby referee at quite a high level at the time of diagnosis. I was also a huge foodie, loved restaurants, loved life. And I was married with two children. Um, and I'll come back to see what, uh, what has happened to me, but still alive. I was going to use a metaphor to take us through this, and it's a very ancient. I hope people will, will recognize snakes and ladders. It's actually a very ancient Indian game from Hindu times back in the second century AD. And it represented the path to enlightenment through the steps. And kind of interestingly, of course, the, the, the ladders help you on your way and the snakes take you backwards. And I thought it was a rather nice metaphor for, for how you live with the ups and downs of, of cancer. Interestingly, the original game um, back then in the ancient times had more snakes than ladders. There was a kind of moral aspect to it. Beware to the children, the Hindu children, beware life has more snakes in it than, than it does ladders. Just having introduced myself, I'd like to introduce my disease. Uh, many of you there will probably know mantle cell lymphoma. In most of the articles that are written about it, um, it starts with this inspiring phrase, um, it has a dismal prognosis, and it really is. Most of you working in the field, or even if you're not, you know that it's one of those tricky um, lymphomas that's uh, mostly non-Hodgkin, but has Hodgkin pieces to it to make it very difficult to treat. Um, e even if the treatment is successful, it almost always relapses, or it always relapses. So it's not a great thing to be told that you have. Um, which brings me really, and this is, you'll see a series of slides with some snakes, some ladders, depends on, on what it is. Um, the diagnosis, interestingly, why it's not a complete snake, um, was that it started, um, I had a lump on my shoulder, I had an ultrasound, I kind of guessed it was cancer. And at that stage, well, you know, my, my, my doctor at the time wouldn't say anything. So I, I went to Dr. Google and Dr. Google said, it's either metastatic cancer from something else, and that's not good, or it could be a lymphoma, and most lymphomas are treatable. So I felt that, that at least if I got a diagnosis of lymphoma, that thing in the year. And that was the case, so that's the ladder. But then, of course, the, the snake was, it's a particular sort of lymphoma, it's mantle cell. And this kind of good news, bad news is really, I found, um, all the way through since 2014, that's how my life has been. Um, I had the standard treatment back then, and this is 2014, which and autologous stem cell treatment. Um, again, maybe interesting for some people to think that uh, that it's a question of, of snakes and ladders. Um, well, um, the very very first dose of chemotherapy I had, um, my I had enormous cell death. And my those swollen lymph nodes just disappeared, almost disappeared overnight, and that gave me such a kick. You know, the idea that okay, it's poison, it's not good, but wow, it's having an effect is surprisingly uplifting. Um, these things are relative, of course. It's not what you choose to do of a day, but 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 it does really help. And then, of course, there's the downsides. I actually found the your stem cell treatment to be even tougher than chemotherapy. I I was 
I got some infections and it was it was tough. It, uh, but I did recover. Um, lots of side effects along the way. Again, what I want to kind of characterize is this. Everything has these two aspects. Side effects, yes, they're unpleasant. It's working. Something's happening inside your body. And those two angles I found quite, quite important for myself. I was always, I mean, you introduced me as a scientist. I haven't been a scientist for many years. Um, but scientific curiosity, and I wanted to know why I was, why the side effect was happening, what was causing it, which of the cocktail of drugs was, was the one that was causing it. And it, it, it somehow helped me to, to know that. The good story. Um, I was in remission. It looked everything was fine. I recovered. Um, it did. Look, scans look good. No evidence of disease. I was hoping that I could look forward to um, perhaps eight to ten. That's the median. I think maybe six, seven, eight, ten years of, of of reasonably good life, and then we'll see. And I was sort of hoping that scientists, people in the audience, <laughs> would have figured it out by then. And and who knows. So I, this was a good time. 2015, I was feeling pretty good. And then, of course, um, I knew it would relapse. It came back in two years, which was a bit quicker than I <laughs> would have wished for. Um, and those of you, any of you with knowledge of mantle cell lymphoma knows, or actually any lymphoma that relapses, it often comes back uh, very aggressively. Uh, mine did. I was very ill very quickly. Um, I was lucky Brutinib had just been, so this is a story of luck. I mean, I said I was amazing to be alive. It's, it's also a, a story of luck. Brutinib had just been uh, approved for use in Europe and in the Netherlands. Uh, a seller of Brutinib, not yet, but a Brutinib had. And that, at least for the beginning, pushed the disease back. In the end, it didn't work with me, um, but it, it gave me a good quality of life for a, a period. Um, so. Another reason to be thankful for for the scientists on that and for the the fast track um, for the submission procedure. Um, but I was ill. I had a very high level of disease, um, too much to have another stem cell transplant. Um, this was a dark time. Um, my, I, those of you who looked carefully on the first second slide when I introduced myself would see that in 2014 I was married with two children, and now I just have two children because my wife sadly passed away. So while I was ill, she got um, a very aggressive cancer and and died. And, and at one stage, we didn't think either of us would make it. So what do you tell two children? OK, they're, they're 20, 21 years old, but losing one parent is bad. Losing two is is a disaster. So this was a very deep time in my life. And along came the trial. So I, I, I started because I had taken Ibrutinib and, and Actually, a friend, a colleague uh, had been was on a trial for a seller of Rutinib. I started to be in his wife works for NIH. So this is how it goes, I think, with patients. We we gather together in little mini groups of patients, and some of us know someone who knows someone. And she said, well, you want to have a seller of Rutinib if you can. Shall I look up a clinical trial? And so this whole idea of clinical trials, the clinicaltribe.gov, the EU sites came up. And I started to dig into it. And I also, of course, looked at mantle cell lymphoma and discovered there was a trial. Um, so I asked the doctor at the same time the doctor had identified me. I was lucky. Um, the trial had just opened in, in Amsterdam. And I, I'm not able to tell you which trial it is, um, but, but if you're smart, you can look it up. Um, I it opened just in Amsterdam. Uh, they put me forward. Why this is a story of, <laughs> of ladders and snakes is that this was not a straightforward process. Um, the first talk between then and about a month, the trial closed because there'd been some unfortunate deaths in the States where the trial had come from. So the trial was suddenly closed and suddenly my options were back to, um, uh, well, wait until the ibrutinib runs out and then salvage chemotherapy, which was basically my, my only option. Um, then suddenly the trial was open again. I was in, but then I had some blood work done and I was out. And this in out went on actually until two minutes before I was due to have the central line placed in to receive the CAR T cells back. Um, 
I had a blood test the night before. My bill, Billy Rubina was was too high, and I was out of the trial right just at the moment I was going to receive my cells back. And then the news came through just a few minutes before that it was okay. It was a stress result, and in fact, the Billy Rubina was fine. But that up and down, in out, exclude and exclusion. Um, I don't know if that. I don't have enough experience of other clinical trials, thankfully. Um, but that for me was was a, a real story of of snakes and ladders. And when when every snake leads down all the way to the bottom, because what what did I have to look forward to? Salvage chemotherapy. It means that every decision becomes a a very serious one. Um, there were side effects. Um, I caught the end of, of uh, Dr. Shrusha uh, Lenz's presentation. She mentioned cytokine release syndrome. Um, that's a side effect unlike anything I came across before. Uh, it put me into intensive care. It gave me a very scary neurotoxic uh, effect that was, um, even I find it difficult to remember, let alone describe. Um, I, I cannot I can't express my respect for the doctors that cared for me and the nurses. Um, I think this is the challenging aspect of CAR T cell, cell therapy, at least from my perspective, and the people in Amsterdam managed admirably, but I can imagine this is, every case is different. And, and knowing when to administer the steroids to, to dampen down the cytokine release syndrome, knowing that if you do it too early, you might leave some cancer cells, uh, it's, I I cannot imagine how people do their jobs. I have immense respect for, for the doctors. And then, that's why I'm sitting here. Um, I'm, it's just over 9th of August, 2018 was the treatment. I've just passed my two years, complete metabolic remission. Um, it's astounding every time I go and have a scan, every time the blood comes, blood work is done. Um, yeah, there are still some things here. My B cells, I have no B cells, so I need monthly uh, immunoglobin um, injections. But <laughs> if you consider the alternative, um, this is trivial. Um, I'm alive. Um, I'm back. I'm strong. I'm running again. And life could, could not be better. Um, it, it, it's hard. And, and that's really, truly why I was so honored and pleased to be able to speak today, because I don't know who's on the call, but if I hope many of you, some of you are involved in trials like this, and um, this is why you do it. So that's sort of my story rather quickly, but 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 I didn't want to dwell on, on too many details. What I did want to talk about a little was sort of my observations. Again, I, I'm not a med medical scientist. I haven't been a scientist for 25 years, but I do retain that kind of curiosity. And I, I do like to look at I've been involved a lot in innovation. Where can we make improvements? And from my perspective as a patient, um, and really my first observation is about the quality of life. And maybe this is is due to the clinical trial, but I actually remember it also from my stem cell treatment. There's a great focus, of course, on, on the body, on um, treatment, on the body reaction. And I find there's... Perhaps only afterwards do people think about the quality of life aspects, and and they're easily forgotten, and also they're forgotten by the patient too. I mean, you know, I'm I, in the struggle to stay alive, you sort of forget what kind of life it might be, and you don't really pause to think. And I certainly didn't, um, and I think I probably should have done more. Um, and also, what can you do during the treatment to to improve the quality of life? And I have kind of two aspects. This I, it's difficult for me to describe this, but there was one statement I gave an interview a few months ago, and, and this is what I said. Remember, I was an athlete. I was fit. I was a referee, rugby rugby referee. I was strong. I was fit. I lost a lot of weight during the treatment, um, even more so than the stem cell transplant, and I I lost muscle. And and people said that I should be happy to be alive, and of course I was. But I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I wasn't the person that I used to be. I I was this gaunt, thin, emaciated person. I was alive, but what kind of life was this? And I know that sounds ungrateful. I know it sounds bad, but that's the kind of thing that goes on in your head. And to come back from that is 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 probably the biggest struggle. Weirdly, um, two elements I'd like to pick out of that. One is food, and the other is fitness. 
I mentioned at the start also, if you read the slide, I'm a big foodie. I love to eat in good restaurants. And of course, these whole treatments, chemotherapy, these, these, all the drugs you take, they alter your sense of taste. They make you nauseous. They, they change your perception of food. But, and so it's very difficult. But food, I find in most of the, at least in my experience, food translates in hospitals to nutrition. And nutrition is what's in, what's out, have you got enough? Um, I don't know if any of you have been unlucky enough to taste some of the nutritional supplements out there, but obviously they're hard to make, but they really don't taste good. Um, and, and food is one of those strange things, at least in me, and I think in other patients I spoke to as well, it's a mood lifter. You give me a good plate of food, I feel better. Um, and yet, in the hospital I was in, and I'm afraid as this is many hospitals around the world, food is not the main piece. It's 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 keeping the patient nutritionally balanced, fine, but taste or appearance, I think it's undervalued and underrepresented. And I would love to see people take that because it's it helps with this quality of life aspect. It helps with the optimism in yourself and makes you feel good. The first thing I did when I came home um, was to cook myself an omelet. I couldn't really taste it very well, but just the fact of doing it. Um, so why can't we have little kitchens in, in cancer units that uh, or bring someone in to help patients learn how to cook nutritionally? All sorts of ideas I have. And I, I just feel this is an area that's waiting to be discovered. It, it's, it's, it's partly, it's not just about the nutrition, but it's about the mood lifting effects of food. Um, and of course it's hard. Um, I know it is, but, but it is something that I'd like to see more focus on. And the second one is fitness. Um, it's so easy, especially when you've had a snake, you know, you slid down a snake, you're at rock bottom. It's so easy just to lie there and, and kind of despair or not do something. The effort to get out of bed, to sit at a table when every, every muscle aches or to even try and trudge around to walk is, is high. And, and, and I think, again, this is something that uh, fortunately, I do see some signs here, and, and there the was in Amsterdam. I'm going to tell you an anecdote uh, in a moment to, to to reflect on this. But I think that the things I did, I was very stubborn. I remember in my stem cell transplant, I was really determined if I had food, I would eat it at the table and not in my bed. Even though it, it, whatever, that's what I did. For lunch and dinner, I'd sit at my table and not in bed. Uh, it, it requires sort of stubbornness, and I think that that is also an under, undervalued part of the story. Um, the anecdote I'd like to share is, uh, so I was in the hematology unit in, in the hospital in Amsterdam, and there was a young um, physiotherapist uh, student, very full of passion, full of, of new ideas. And she'd seen a couple of the more stubborn uh, guys um, trudging, doing like back and forth along the corridor with our intravenous hole, um, we did sometimes circuits of the nurses' station, just trudging along, trying to trying to get some activity going. And she'd seen this, and not we didn't know, unbeknown to us, she found some way of she found this image, and printed it on stickers. And there's one for ten meters, twenty meters, thirty meters, fifty meters, which is the circle around the nursing station around all of the ward. And she stuck them up one night, and I just thought, what a brilliant, brilliant small act but that meant something very big and that's i think also what i'd like to to that's sort of the message really that i have is when you're talking about quality of life often those small interventions can have a massive effect on a patient um, she used to get us up doing physiotherapy it didn't matter if we were in wheelchairs whether we could if we could just trudge to the to a place she would get us doing some form of physiotherapy and it was tiny it was insignificant and yet it wasn't, it was huge. And I think that that is is, is what I'd like to, to leave here. And lastly, um, what's become my mantra, um, I've been given a second life, thanks to, to people on this call, people who, who were involved in the clinical trials, the doctors and nurses at the hospital in Amsterdam, the hospitals in the US, the pharma company that's developed the treatment, the clinical trial regulators who, who've approved it, um, it, all of those people, all of you, the people listening in, hopefully to this, all of you helped give me a second life. Um, if it, 
if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. Um, and all I can do is promise that I'm going to make the most of it and share with you what some words that have really helped me. Um, back and it's never too late to be what you might have been.